Welcome to the Catholic Culture Podcast. I'm Thomas V. Miras. This podcast is an offering to the Holy Family and, less importantly, a production of CatholicCulture.org. everybody. Welcome back to the Catholic Culture Podcast. It's long past time for another musical episode. I think the last one I did was on Christmas carols, so it's been a few months. For Lent, I wanted to focus on a piece of music which I only listened to in its entirety for the first time on Good Friday of last year and found very moving and has since become one of my favorite pieces of sacred music. The Sabbat Mater, many of you will know as the hymn that we sing a stanza of in between each of the stations of the cross when we're doing that devotion during Lent. Probably most familiar with the version or the translation that's included in a booklet of St. Alphonsus Liguri's Stations of the Cross. But this piece of music, this text has been set by a great many composers, great and small alike, over the centuries since it was composed in, I believe, the 13th century or maybe the 14th century. But the setting we'll be discussing today is by Giovanni Battista Pergolesi. It's one of the most famous settings of this piece. It was written as he was dying of tuberculosis at the age of 26. And with me today to speak about this is an expert in Pergolesi, Francesco Cotticelli, who is a professor of theater studies at the University of Naples, Federico II. Welcome to the show, Francesco. Oh, thank you for inviting me. So perhaps we could start out with a little bit about the history of this text, the Stabat Mater, where it came from, who wrote it, as far as we can tell, and what it was originally used for. Well, as you say, this text goes back to the Middle Ages, when the worship of Our Lady of Seven Sorrows spread all over Europe and mark the celebrations during Lent. Uh, um, it's uh, technically a sequenza, so a combination of different terzine, as we say in Italian, so a group of three verses which are a specific time of rhythm and rhymes. And it is usually attributed to Jacopone da Todi, although this attribution is not certain, but it's based on the similarities with his uh, Laude, and especially a, a famous text, Donna de Paradiso, Women from Heaven, which deals more or less with the same topic as the Sabbath matter. And it was written in vernacular as opposed to Latin. The sequence had recently been reintroduced into the Catholic liturgy when Pergolesi had the chance to set it to music. Just to demonstrate how deep and intense the devotion for the Lady of the Seven Sorrow in Naples and in Europe was. So can you tell us a little bit more about the text itself? I mean, the poem, what its purpose is on a devotional level? Well, the poem concentrates on the moment of Christ on the cross and the lady standing at the foot of the cross, uh, contemplating his son's death. But the particular feature of this sex uh, is that the uh, first section is describes more or less the reaction of the Virgin in, in this intense moment of uh, Christ's life and of all the Christianity. While the second part is uh, faithful prayers to be able to share the virgin sorrow and so to be worthy of this redemption process, uh, which culminates into the moment of the death and of the resurrection. So the first half of the verses or so is focused on the experience of Our Lady, yeah. whereas the second half is a petition directly from the point of view of the exactly. listener. Exactly. The listener, and it's a very, very, very uh, touching prayer. So we pray the Virgin that she could make us worthy of sharing her sorrow, of feeling the same pain as Christ did on the cross, and of being a part of the salvation adventure of mankind. And this is a very old kind of practice of Marian devotion, mm -hmm. not only with the seven sorrows, but with the whole experience of the life of Mary and a deep aspect of Catholic spirituality that has developed over the centuries, particularly since the Middle Ages, asking to enter into her joys and to have her as a mediator in our mm -hmm. relationship with Christ. Which is very important. And, you know, probably we are also must focus on the idea that the worship of Mary was really intense and strong throughout the period when 
Pergolesi had the chance to set to music several pieces. So he was also very well known for a Salve Regina, for example, for setting to music a very, very famous prayer dedicated to Our Lady. I should probably clarify for my audience that when you say worship, you mean honoring Mary in a secondary secondary sense. People can use Mm -hmm. that word in in a different different senses. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in case there are any Protestants listening, we distinguish between uh, different degrees of worship. One is the honor due to God alone, of course, Mm -hmm. and then the honors due to Mary and the other saints are distinct. Yeah. I'd also just like to point out something that might be interesting to my listeners. The translation, it's a, a loose but faithful in spirit translation that many listeners in the English-speaking world will be familiar with. The first verse goes, At the cross her station keeping stood the mournful mother weeping close to Jesus to the last. That translation is by one Edward Caswell from a collection called Lyra Catholica, which w- he was a clergyman who converted from Anglicanism to Catholicism due to the influence of St. John Henry Newman, who was canonized late last year. And he joined the oratory under Newman, mm-hmm. and he translated many other hymns from the Roman breviary uh, as well. But this is one of his more well-known translations. So let's talk about Pergolesi and just give a, an introduction to his career. Well, as you said, he died when he was only 26, so it belongs to one of the most interesting myths of the Western music. But Pergolesi was born in a little village in central Italy called Iesi, which is a very, very, very nice place to visit. And he was the son of a sergeant in the public army, so he could receive his first musical education thanks to the support of aristocratic patrons so, who helped him a lot and made it possible for him to leave Yeezy and reach Naples when he was only 13. Naples at that time was an absolute capital for uh, musical education, and Pergolesi had the possibility of being accepted into the Conservatory of the Poveri di Gesù Cristo, so the poor people of Jesus Christ. There, he could improve his talent under the guidance of De Matteis for as regards the violin, and Gaetano Greco as regards the possibility of learning how to compose music. Well, we have clarified that the conservatories had been established mainly as uh, orphanages, but in these institutions, pupils had the chance to receive education and what is more important, to learn a trade. So many of them were educated to become composers, musicians, and most of the people who were active in Naples and in Europe at that time came from these public conservatories. And the Providence di Gesù Cristo was the only conservatory run by the local church, but there were four of them, for example, in Naples. When Pergolesi reached the age of 18, as all the young pupils had to prove his skills by taking part in several liturgical services, before this, musicians were entrusted with more challenging responsibilities. At the beginning of the 30s in the 18th century, Pergolesi was commissioned with an oratorio and had his first striking success. What is typical of these composers at that time uh, in a very, very, very active city as regards the musical life and the theater life was that he could devote himself both to sacred music and to theater music. In 1732, for example, Pergolesi had his debut as an opera composer with La Salustia, but for example, we remember also his uh, setting to music of Metastasios, Olympia de Rome in 1735, and among his works are certainly one of the most famous Commedia de Musica, buffo operas of the 18th century, that are Il Frate Innamorato, so the, the brother in love, in 1732 for the Teatro di Fiorentini in Naples, uh, and uh, Flaminio, which was staged in 1735 uh, at the Teatro Nuovo in Naples, so just one year before his death. Because Pergolesi's use of theatrical techniques in his setting of the Stabat Mater is a topic that will come up, the first thing I'll play is an aria from one of his operas, L'Olimpiada, used with kind permission from the singer Lyubov Petrova.
I think when you're listening to the parts of the Stabat Mater, which you'll be hearing in the course of this episode, you'll notice some stylistic similarities there, but also some differences. For example, in the Stabat Mater, as compared to the opera, you're not going to hear a lot of really flashy vocal runs where uh, they go on for so long that you almost lose the word that's being sung. The Stabat Mater, as a work of sacred music with focus on the words, is much more restrained. So back to the conversation. I have to point out that legend has it that the Sabbath matter was composed when he was about to die, because this is a part of a romantic legend which has been developed starting from the mid-19th century. Pergolisi was the perfect figure to be interpreted as the man doomed to suffer, doomed to an early death. But as a matter of fact, what we know is that Sabbath matter was commissioned by a confraternity, yes, the confraternity of the Blessed Virgin in Naples towards the end of 1734. So it took more or less two years for Pergolesi to complete this score. In the meantime, he devoted himself to other tasks, by the way, but uh, certainly Sabbat Mater was one of his last plays. So it was composed over a period of years, but may have been completed shortly before his death. Yeah, shortly before it, yes. We can be quite sure that Pergolesi finished the Sabbat Mater just a couple of weeks before dying, but he was entrusted with the composition of this music at least two years before. Although we have never found evidence of the special interest from this confraternity of the Blessed Virgin. Can you give us a sense of the musical period that Pergolesi lived in? What would have been his influences as a composer, and particularly in composing a work such as this? And what advances did he make in his approach to setting this piece? If you're talking about you know, his approach to sacred music, Pergolesi was uh, certainly one of the most interesting composers in this field. For example, I would like to just to remind of the reaction that the Sabbath matter rose when it was first played and it was first known by other musicians all over Italy. Just to make an example, there is a very famous figure in the field of musical studies and of musical production in the 18th century, Padre Martini from Bologna. And we owe Padre Martini some of the worst comments and judgments about Pergolesi's Sabbath Mater, because the main problem that Pergolesi raised with this setting was that, after all, we are before a very, very, very new way of interpreting the sequence inside the Sabbath Mater, the liturgical and the situation. But Padre Martini reproached Pergolesi for using too much of theatricality in describing this moment uh, and in helping people to join Mary in this time of sorrow and in this time of despair, which is something that you can notice, especially if you know some of the musical production of Pergolesi around the Sabbath Mother. So you may hear every now and then some reminiscence of uh, theater successes which had been celebrated all over Naples and abroad, I could say, if we think of Italy at that time. But, you know, probably this is what changed once and for all the history of this setting on this Stabat Mater, so that Pergolesi had become a model for any composer who ever attempted to dedicate himself to the story of Mary at the foot of the cross. Because sacred music for Pergolesi was not just a, a celebration, a moment of solemnity within the liturgy. It's a kind of prayer. It's the moment when you involve the faithful with different means in the spiritual process of the liturgy. And this is what strikes me the most, and it's really striking when you hear Pergolesi setting the music. Yes, you have an amount of theatricality, but you also have a very harmonic simplicity where the melody prevails over other effects. But the effect is that you really take part in what is going on. The sacred history becomes human. You recognize your sorrow and you can interpret your sorrow in light of the the general destiny of our life, our faith, just as if you were 
you know, near the Virgin and taking part in that crucial moment for everyone. So you're suggesting that previous settings of this may have been a bit more otherworldly? Not worldly, but probably focusing on solemnity, focusing on accompanying the liturgy. This is a moment where you have sacred music, but you have something that reminds you of your way of facing sorrow, of your way of facing death. So the asking to participate in the sorrow gets more intense and profound accents in this setting, which was a scandal for the time, but that accounts also for the incredible success of the setting. So sacred music becomes human and mankind becomes sacred in a way with the Virgin at the foot of the cross. You know, this opposition of contemplation and action in the music setting is very, very, very interesting. All right, well, let's start listening to the piece itself. I'm thankful to the ensemble La Nuova Musica, directed by David Bates, for allowing us to use parts of their recording of Pergolesi's Stabat Mater for this episode. It features soprano Lucy Crow and countertenor Tim Mead. So for each piece that we'll hear before I play it, I will read the verse that is set in the piece mm-hmm. in Latin and English. So the first movement sets the first verse, Stabat mater dolorosa, juxta crucem lacrimosa, dum pendebat filius. And the translation mm-hmm. is, the grieving mother stood weeping beside the cross where her son was hanging.
let's talk a little bit about how Pergolesi draws us in expressively with this first movement. Mm-hmm. Which is a typical movement, I would say, of contemplation. You picture the image of a virgin standing near the cross and seeing, you know, as beloved son dying. And the musical structure is very simple. And there is a sort of, I would say, opposition and uh, contamination between the two voices with a clear emphasis on the melody. This fact uh, is particularly interesting when you listen to the beginning of the second movement, of the second part of the sequence, of the sequenza, when you really can realize how you move from a moment of silence and intensity to a moment of, of action. Well, that's an interesting point because there are some movements that are a little faster than yeah. than one might associate yeah. with a sorrowful mood. Is there a difference in how audiences... And by the way, the t- Thomas, sorry to interrupt you. By the way, those movements which are a bit faster, exactly the movements which were said to be too theatrical, so that they were indebted to the music played in theaters at that time, which was seen as strikingly different from some listeners of that time. So they were considered to be an unusual, even at the time. Yeah, yeah. I have another question about that coming up, but I'll wait. Just to speak a little bit more about the first movement, Mm -hmm. there's some interesting things going on in that the singing starts with both voices. A lot of the pieces will start with just one voice and then bring the other one in. Mm -hmm. In this case, the other voice enters almost immediately after the first, and they've got this kind of contrapuntal harmonization of the voices. Is there any reason that he starts in this way, with both of the voices kind of overlapping each other? To tell the truth, I've uh, always had the impression that uh, this special beginning implies that, you know, there is a a gradual involvement in the way you take part in this action, that you take part also in this contemplation. So this is sacred music, which does not only emphasize uh, the moment, the liturgical moment, it's also a call for each one of us. It talks to the individual. And I've always had the impression that focusing on the individual voice and making it clear, although in this combination, is particularly important for what Pergolese implies. So each one of us is summoned and is asked to react to this story, to this episode to this expression of sorrow, to this crucial moment in his history. I see. There's one other thing I'd like to note about this first movement, because it's something that will recur in the sixth movement, which depicts the actual moment of Christ's death, which is this Mm -hmm. deceptive cadence, the beginning and the end, and in some parts in the middle of the piece. For those of my listeners who don't know what that is, it's just, I'll play the exact little clip so you can hear what I'm talking about, but it's this moment where you think that this tension is going to resolve and then it doesn't and it seems like it's going to resolve again and it doesn't and that happens a couple times before it actually resolves and closes and this is uh, and then it's the moment when Pergolesi captures the instant of death So you think that that in the first movement also, that is a reference to death? Yes, we all know what is going on. We all know what, what's happening. And we all know that this is the tragic moment of Christ's life. So, for example, when there is also a comment saying that the Sabbath mother is not as hopeful as it should be. I really think that the Sabbath mother expressed a kind of hope and tension for the future, which we may experience uh, in the time of death, when we are overwhelmed by sorrow, probably, but we also see a light 
hmm. beyond that event, beyond that episode. Right, and that's something... I really think that this is the feeling underlying this score and underlying this setting. Okay, very interesting. Uh, the experience of human sorrow and the idea that there is something that transcends this sorrow. Right. And we should use this sorrow to look beyond that sorrow, beyond that death. We can come back to that when we speak about the last movement and how it ends. Mm -hmm. I guess one other thing about this movement, there's an interesting point where he takes almost at the very end of the piece, he takes two words and sets them out of order. So he takes the words dolorosa and lacrimosa, mm -hmm. sorrowful and, and tears, I guess, and sets them so in like isolation. He, he takes the last line and interrupts them by repeating those two words. And that's interesting because he doesn't very often, correct me if I'm wrong, but he doesn't very often take the words out of order, does he? No, but you know, these are the basic words to describe and to focus on a feeling. So Dolorosa and Lacrimosa are a clear reference to the sorrow, to weeping, so I insist on this idea of giving a portrait of some human sorrow going on, mm. which is really important because the real problem is that you want me to identify with the sorrow because this is the way you should experience your faith in this moment. This is part of your story. This is part of your life. It belongs to you. Right. And there's an, this is about you. that's also one of those moments where there's a pause for contemplation that, that kind of slows down. Yeah. They stop harmonizing each other. Each word is given to one of the voices, and then there's a rest. And there is some space for rest, yes, for rest and the idea of silence, you know, connected to the solemnity of the moment. Okay, so for movement two, there's something about sort of the modern conventions where we associate something faster with being upbeat. Mm -hmm. That's not necessarily how people at the time would have heard it. Would it, they have heard it more as kind of agitated? What is important here is the, the contrast between the first section and the second one. So the Kugus Animam Gementem introduced you to a different situation. I wouldn't say, you know, you are before some agitation, but that's what I meant when I said that there is a passage from uh, contemplation to action. In this moment, you see the sorrow is not static, that there is a kind of intimate movement, perspective changes. You know, you're not contemplating sorrow, you're just not picturing the situation, but you are invited to understand the intimate agitation of the Virgin and of everyone looking at this specific moment. As I said, this is the moment when you recognize some incredible similarities between the setting here and some moments taken from Pergolese's uh, place for the opera houses both comic and serious. Yeah, so Don't forget that the people at that time were immediately able to understand this change of register, this change of intensity. Right. So like these quotations imply, I want to emphasize and introduce some action. Perhaps you could also describe it as showing sort of the violence of sorrow as opposed to just the more what you would call more of a sort of depressing. And by the way, the violence of Christ's death. Right you know, man on the cross, a gladius, a sword that is going to kill. So there are very effective images, you know, behind that. So before we hear the piece, let me read the text. Cuius animam gementem contristatam et dolentem per transivit gladius. Through her weeping soul, compassionate and grieving, a sword passed. Oh, 
there's a number of different things that he does with this word per transivit, talking about the sword mm-hmm. passing through her soul. Can we talk about that? Per transivit. Well, there's an image of violence, but also an idea, an idea, I would say an interesting idea of penetration, because it's not only the violence of this death, it's also the effectiveness of Christ's sacrifice, which is going to per transire as faithful. Mm. So this is a key word. So it's it's about the depth and sort of completeness of the effect of the sacrifice. Yes. You also have to imagine that the, the Latin verb implies that you are going very, very deep, per transire. So Paris is an in intensifier. This is why, you know, the, this word play an important role in the development of the musical structure and of the musical tale. What does he do musically with this word? Choosing to emphasize it as much as it can. There's one part where the first time he uses it, I believe it's a little bit dissonant. There's an augmented fourth for listeners who will understand what I'm talking about. Then that the most intense moment of the setting is where he just hammers on that one note, that high note mm-hmm. on Pertron CV with the trills. That's kind of the most violent part. An emotional yeah, one. In mm-hmm. the soprano. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll play that segment mm-hmm. again for people. Can you say anything about Pergolesi's overall approach to text setting and word painting and things like that? Are there any strategies that we see recurring throughout the piece? Probably the one thing I would like to underline in this setting is that Pergolesi intends to solicit the compassion. But how can I put that? I have the impression that mixing moments of contemplation and moments of, we could say, action, moments of more intense expression of feelings, Pergolesi manages to give us a painting of this moment, which is not a static, motionless. So the Virgin is in despair. We take part in her despair. And every now and then we are asked to also watch the scene from apart and try to understand the importance of what is going on in our own destiny, in our own life, in our own future as well. So I have the impression that when you hear the music, your eyes and ears move from the Virgin to Christ suffering on the cross, and the music is able to capture even the instant of death. Hmm. So you, you are always involved in the situation, just by looking and figuring out the virgin sorrow or by imagining that you want to be there, that you want to be a part of it. I see. And when you say despair, of course, you mean like an intense sorrow. An intense uh, sorrow. Not, not yeah, like intense in the, sorrow, yes. Not in the literal yes, sense. Yes, which is human. Which is human. Yeah. Which is human. You know, which reminds you of the moment when you are facing death as a human being. Right. This is the great mystery, you know, and this is what we are called to focus on when we contemplate in what Christ did for us. Right. It's not despair in the sense of lack of hope or... In lack of hope. No, no, absolutely. Absolutely not. But it's human, you know, it's a human reaction to the mystery of death. Yeah. What you say about moments of contemplation, uh, there is a little quote that I wrote down from an article that I read by another scholar about this piece where he talks about the use of fermatas and rests Mm -hmm. in the piece. He says, I'll just quote real quick because it's interesting. He says, fermatas prolong half cadences or rests, allowing each item of suffering to be contemplated at length and making it seem as if their combined weight were impeding the most basic actions, speaking, crying, even breathing, which is a very interesting observation because there are a lot of little moments of rest where the action stops for a moment in between Mm. phrases in this piece. But still you have the impression that there's something going on. There is some action and contemplation, no mixing together, which is really, really fascinating. This involves the faithful. I'd like to jump to the sixth movement. This is the kind of the turning point of the piece. Yes. It's, the, it's not only the one that depicts 
Christ's death in most detail, but it also is the last one that focuses solely on the Virgin Mary before we turn to the supplications. Yes, yes. It's usually regarded as the final part of the first section of the sequence, right. uh, because there is this basic difference between the moment dedicated to the Virgin and the moment focusing on the faithful reaction to the situation. So he does set this in a lot of expressive detail. So the Latin text is vidit sum dulcem natum, moriendo desolatum, dum emisit spiritum. She saw her mm-hmm. sweet offspring dying forsaken while he gave up his spirit. So he kind of breaks that up into three parts. First, she saw her sweet offspring, then dying forsaken, then while he gave up his spirit. And each of those little segments of the text gets its own expressive treatment. I really think that here we have a kind of transfer. So far, the Virgin has been the main character in the, in this situation, but the final moment capturing, you know, the instant of the death uh, moves our sight slowly to Christ dying. After all, he is the basic figure in what is going on on the Calvary, we have to be taken slowly to the contemplation of the mystery of Christ's death, Dume Misit Spiritum, which is also the peak of this concentration, I would say. This is why, you know, the, the first section ends here, and we are reminded of the gospel words, uh, consumatum est, so everything has been done. This is a crucial moment, it's something really really, really intense for everyone. And I would say that here, the light moves slowly from the Virgin to the cross. And from the cross, you know, farther on to every man for for whom, you know, the cross was intended.
And that brings us back to that deceptive cadence. We get that at the end of the piece after the voices have ceased. Mm -hmm. Yes, but probably, you know, it was also looking for some correspondence between the two sections. These things uh, happen to work a lot when you need to concentrate on a a very intense piece of music such as the Sabbath Matter. Mm. Probably, I would say that, you know, after all, the second part implies that you're going to ask the Blessed Virgin to help you become just like her at the foot of the cross. And so there is a sort of, you know, after all, your aspiration is to be, to be there and to be just like the Virgin, Mm. ready, ready to follow that example, ready to have your heart burn Mm. for facutarbi at corum eum. So ready to be a part, a whole part of it. So let's talk about the seventh movement. This is the first of the supplications from the listener's point of view. The text is, Ea mater fons amoris me sentire vim dolores facut tecum lugeam. O mother fountain of love, make me feel the power of sorrow that I may grieve with you. This is another quick movement, and it's also in three, just like the second movement was. Yes, and this is also, I would say, the instinctive reaction of the faithful contemplating the scene of Christ's death and, the, and contemplating the reaction of the Virgin. So there is a sort of a specific and intense and determined involvement in it. So I think that this is, accounts for the special energy you feel at the beginning of this movement. So this is the moment when I ask you to help me 
to take a part, to share your sorrow and to be worthy of what is going on, to be worthy of this sacrifice. Right. And that's a phrase that repeats in the verses over and over again. And it's also interesting that the Blessed Virgin is defined as fons amoris, the source of love. Yes, yes, indeed. Not sorrow, but love. You know, there is also this opening to, to hope, mm. to, to a different image. I think the most interesting moment in the text setting in this piece is on that line, Fakut tecum lugeam. It's the, uh, that I may grieve with you. It's the section where the, the text is just on this one repeated note in the middle range, and all the other instruments are kind of moving around it, and the voice for once, has kind of almost a, a subordinate role, a less interesting melodic part. And then you've got this kind of, the other instruments kind of twining around it, which almost expresses, to me anyway, kind of a passivity of the voice. Supplicant is asking, we're asking something to have something done to us. So the instruments, I don't know if you would describe them as the workings of grace, you know, on the voice or what, but they have a more dominant role in that moment. They have more dominant role, but, you know, this is a transformation of the situation. There is grace, as I say, but there is also the idea of uh, asking for help to be transformed. Mm -hmm. So probably the change also implies this change of perspective. Make so that I could weep with you. Mm -hmm. So help me to transform my soul so that I can really share your sorrow and I can really have your reaction with you. There is a repetition of this structure, make that I, make that I, is repeated. So we ask for the lady's help to become like her. So to become active in this process, you know, that's the problem. I really think that what Pergolesi changed when he, he set to music this uh, sequenza, was the intuition that, after all, we have to use our human feelings to understand how we can get worthy of experience something higher. And the text is very clear. So we ask for help. This is just not on us. Yes, yes. This is a, an effect of grace. This is an effect of salvation. And this requires also the presence of the the Virgin. I have to ask, is this your personal favorite setting of the Stabat Mater? Yes. So would it be fair to say that Pergolesi was a Baroque composer? Yes, yes. Can you tell uh, my listeners in a general kind of sense what some of the musical characteristics of this age would be? Well, elegance. Pergolesi was also connected, for example, to the Stile Galante. And this search for simplicity, which is also linked to a clarity of comprehension, giving the impression, for example, of great naturalness and getting rid of too many musical decorations in order to make music more adherent to the needs of communicating given by a text. So this Gallant style, this is a development sort of ushering out the end of the Baroque period? Yeah, yes, Which yes. would have been a little bit more, more ornate. We're certainly moving on towards a different moment. And I have to say that Pergolesi set an example in most of the fields where he could exert his talent. Stabat Mater became a model, but I could also say that, for example, he had more or less the same importance as regards the comic music. Right. So just think of La Serva Padrona, his famous intermezzo, which was played uh, all over Europe uh, and was very well known. And by the way, it was also the reason why uh, the famous Querelle of Buffon rose in France uh, at the end of the 18th century, just in op opposing the French music and Italian music. Uh, and Pergolesi, Serva Padrona, was considered a model of simplicity, of effectiveness, of musical intensity. So he lived only 26 years, but he accomplished a really lot. My favorite movement on a musical level is number nine, both the beauty of the melody and how it's developed throughout. So it's an interesting movement because many of the other movements only set one or two verses, but at least all of the ones we've discussed so far have only had one verse. This one has five verses. It gets through five verses in a pretty short, in just a few minutes. It's really beautiful, very warm and affectionate sounding. 
I would say. Oh, I'll read the text here. So the first two verses that are set in this movement are alternated between the voices. And the first line is Sancta Mater Istud Agas, Crucifixi, Fige Plagas, Cordi Meo, Valide. Holy Mother, grant that the wounds of the crucified drive deep into my heart. And mm-hmm. then the second is Tui Nati Vulnerati, Tom Dignati Prome Pati, Penas Mecum Divide. That of your wounded son who so deigned to suffer for me, I may share the pain. And both of these are given, if I can speak a little bit about the, the melodic development here, both of these lines are, are given the same melody in different voices. Then the third verse of this movement introduces a new theme, which is quite different, has some aspects of the first in the way that it ends. It's a minor harmonized theme between the two voices. And here we have this request with the word fac. Fac me vere tecum flere, crucifixo condolere, donec ego vixero. Let me sincerely weep with you, bemoan the crucified for as long as I live. And then we return to a variation on the first theme, but it's now in a minor key, whereas it started out in a major key, and there's a more rapid alternation between the voices. And the line is, Juxta crucem tecum stare te libenter sociare in planctu desidero, to stand beside the cross with you and gladly share the weeping, this I desire. And then finally, it goes almost, with the last line, it goes almost back to the first version of the theme, but it starts in minor and then moves into major, but it also incorporates aspects of the second theme in this final verse. So the final verse is, Virgo virginum, preclara mihi yam non si samara, fac me tecum plangere. Chosen virgin of virgins, be not bitter with me, let me weep with thee. No, I think that you're basically right. Probably what I would like to point out to the listeners is that you should listen carefully to the text and see how the second part represents all the images, you know, the wounds, the the sore, the sorrow. So all the key words we had already listened to in the first part. So um, sometimes you also have the impression that there is a sort of repetition, but all these concepts are adapted to the uh, different situation not just the description of, of a feeling, a description of a, of a wound, the description of sorrow, but the idea that all these elements can become a way to access the mystery and a way to access faith and to share Christ's destiny. I insist on the repetition of Fakul. If you consider carefully, the text represents a sort of rewind of the basic concepts in a different perspective. I don't know if I've been clear enough, but... No, I think so. Basically, the idea is that we're revisiting some of these themes and there's echoes of the way these ideas, these key words were treated in the first half 
but they are given a different perspective. Now, how would you say that that comes out in an expressive way? Would you say that because there is a certain detachment of perspective, I mean, simultaneously a detachment of perspective, but it's also an attempt to enter into the primary perspective of Our Lady? Yes, these are all they all hypothesis, but the more we reflect on these things, uh, the more we realize how complicated and how sophisticated Pergolesi's approach to this theme was, not only from a technically musical perspective, but also considering that the text has a special balance in it. And in some ways, you have to reflect it and you have to make it clear, you make it particularly clear to the listener. So this is what I'm, there is a detachment, there is certainly, I would say, also a huge watershed between the first section and the second section, but some of the so-called tricks, so some of the musical intention, some of the basic considerations behind the music setting are the same. So do you think that the second half of this is a little bit more, the sorrow is a little less violent and immediate? I would say so, and I would say also that this is the moment when sorrow has to open to the perspective of hope and faith. Hmm. The reaction of the faithful to Christ's sacrifice is what is expected, after all. You know, this was not useless. Uh, This was to finally make my soul worthy of joining this process of redemption and salvation. So I really think that there is a... I don't know if you use the word cheerful... Well, it's, yeah, it's not quite, but... No, you have some more light.
you know, I just thought of something. Uh, you could also, when you speak about the the second half bringing in more of an element of hope, you could also, because we've been looking at it through the eyes of the listener, but you could also say that looking at it through the eyes of Mary, that's where some of the hope lies for her as well. Not only hope for the resurrection and ascension into heaven of her son and the ultimate victory of God, but also you know, she recognizes that this is occurring for the salvation of souls. So some of the consolation for her surely also occurs in her, if you want to reverse it, in her contemplation of the good effects of her son's death on the faithful. And after all, through this repetition of formulas, Fakut and this recurrent asking for help, the second part of the text is clearly a definitive acknowledgement of the importance of Mary's figure in the history mm. of the church. Yeah, absolutely. I would also point out this special aspect. She has become the mother of the church. She has become the reference point, we could say, for any faithful who want to get closer to Christ and to the faith. And she's given quite a bit of power in this piece. Make me do this, make me do that. I mean, it's understood that the graces are yeah, coming yeah, from yeah. from Jesus, but that she has real authority over you know, the way in which these graces are distributed. Exactly. So, and then this is why, you know, then this hymn and this sequence was also sung uh, on different occasions apart from Lent, because after all, I would say the moment when the, the lady is consecrated and, and it's really acknowledged as a, a major figure in our faith. Just out of curiosity, what would have been some of the influential settings before Pergolesi's time? You know that according to a research investigations or hypothesis, Pergolesi was asked to compose a new Sabbath matter because this confraternity used to use intensively the previous setting by Alessandro Scarlatti during Lent and on each uh, Sunday in the month of March. And this uh, setting by Scarlatti had been played for, well, I would say for 15, 20 years now. So they needed some new music. Uh, and probably one of the private members of this confraternity was not really satisfied with the excess of solemnity offered by Scarlatti setting. So this is why probably Pergolesi accepted the challenge of facing the same topic, facing the same tragic and intense moment in Christ's life, and by simplifying it, making it more human and making it closer to the faithful. Let's talk about the final movement here. The text is Quando corpus morietur, facut anime donetur, paradisi gloria. When my body dies, may my soul be granted the glory of paradise. And then it ends with the Amen.
it's interesting because we're talking about the soul going to heaven and yet and, and here we can return to your subject of you know whether the piece ends hopefully we have a very somber mood and a, a similar kind of plotting steady baseline to the very first movement even though the text is speaking of the glory of paradise so what do you think is going on there well, I think that you are listening to the sincerest expression of hope in a moment of death. So you have hope seems to be denied by the events. Christ is dead. Hope seems to be denied by these real facts. And yet when the body dies, now we can think of a paradisi gloria. So it makes us long for the, the glory of heaven, which is a very important clue because this is the moment when we recognize that Christ's sacrifice opens us the doors of heaven. This is not just a contemplation of death. This is the contemplation of a radius future beyond death. And, you know, this perspective of the Paradisi Gloria, this hope, uh, this ray of light, which comes suddenly, is, the I think, the, the best hope you can express in a moment of sorrow and of despair in the sense you explained that we have experienced so far. You know, it's interesting because the words are hopeful, and yet the and the context right, is so not. it almost is a state it, from a human perspective. You could have had a composer, and some other composers approached it this way, including some people who edited Pergolesi's piece later on and did, did their own version of it. You could have a setting where th- that is given a more happy setting, but Pergolesi is almost telling us that hope does not require feeling good in the moment, that just because you feel bad doesn't mean you're despairing. Your hope can be just as real, even if you're sorrowful. Which is probably the only clue referring to his real situation at that moment. Pergolesi was seriously healed, so he probably composed the Sabbath Mater when he was suffering from uh, Mm. tuberculosis, and so he was about to die. I really think that there is some truth behind the legend. So he probably was, I couldn't say he was feeling death, but it was in the situation that he he couldn't think of death as a remote perspective Mm. in his life, if you know what I mean. And I really think that this must have affected the way he, he dealt with this topic. And as for, you know, this problem of a hope in the sorrowful moment of death, well, this is a more interesting issue. For example, if, if we think of comparing the different settings of the Requiem. So we end with this very energetic amen. Does that put a different spin on the ending for you, or or do you just take that as we need a more energetic and definitive ending rather than just kind of fading out? Yeah, it's also a tribute to the typical conclusion of this species of sacred music. So I would say this is not the the most original part of it, but it's very Mm. effective as well. We referred to some criticism of the piece received both for being overly emotional and for perhaps some people didn't feel that it was hopeful enough. My understanding is that a number of people actually took the piece and tweaked it more what they thought it should have been in subsequent centuries. Yeah, you know, that this is probably a problem related to the religious sensitivity of every moment, every historical phase. I think that the most intelligent and sensitive criticism lies in the what I define as the use of some theatricality in the setting, which is real, after all. But probably Pergolesi understood that the use of some more theatrical atmosphere would have deepened and enhanced the effectiveness of this musical setting. So I'm probably in the the mid-18th century, the the mixture of sacred music, of sacred music style and theatricality was a sort of scandal. I don't know if it was a provocation from Pergolesi, but it, it certainly worked. This is the problem. So I don't think that we are distracted as faithful when we listen to the mm. Stabat Mater, but probably we are encouraged to feel uh, this musical tale as something real and involving and talking mm. about me more than with any other uh, stylistic or technical solution he could have adopted. Did anybody at the time say, this is a beautiful piece of music and it's very pious and edifying, but it's not appropriate for the liturgy. Why don't we use it in a non-liturgical context for devotion? 
as far as I know. What is certain is that, for example, the Pergolesis music was used in the German-speaking world, but it was mainly adapted to different texts. Probably what accounts for this phenomenon is the real difference between a Protestant sensitivity right. and a Catholic one. But what is interesting as regards your question is that not the music was refused by the text, but oh, the text. Okay. Okay. So, which means that the music had a universal power which everybody was ready to admit and recognize. Bach used the music, did he not? Yeah. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. But you know that here, Dil Gehöchster meine Sünden, and the music was used for uh, probably a text which was better suited for uh, uh, Protestant mm -hmm. listeners. But what was refused, again, was not the music. Very interesting. Can you uh, mention briefly some of the other significant settings of this piece that might be worth checking out? I think that the most interesting renderings of this text are those immediately following Pergolesis. Uh, for example, I'm thinking of Nicola Fago, Domenico Scarlatti, or, um, Stefani, Logroshino. They are all very famous composers of the 18th century. But you know why? This is the moment when you realize uh, how and to what extent Pergolesis set an example. So it was a sort of no return point. There was no way to imagine a Sabbath mother which could not deal with the same intensity, the, the same depth, and the same grade of involvement of the listener as in Pergolesi. Francesco Cotticelli, thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank you, and let me express my best wishes for a holy Easter to all the listeners, and even in these difficult times we are living right now. So happy Easter. Bye. All right, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that and found it edifying for Holy Week. If you'd like to listen to the entirety of this piece at your leisure, and I highly recommend that you do, the version that you heard in this episode was courtesy of La Nuova Musica, directed by David Bates, featuring soprano Lucy Crow and countertenor Tim Mead. So you can check that version out. I'll link to that at the show notes. And the CD that I own are really beautiful and perhaps even more emotionally intense with tempos just a hair slower performance is that of Concerto Italiano, directed by Rinaldo Alessandrini, sung by two female singers, Gemma Bertagnoli and Sara Mingardo. I wish you all a blessed triduum and a very happy Easter. Easter.